And without further ado, um, you know, once again, thanks to everybody um, who's made the time to be here today. Um, my name is Anne Hand. I'm a Senior Program Manager for Leadership and Equity Initiatives at Hispanics and Philanthropy. Um, and we're just so happy um, that you could be here today or that you're listening after the fact. Um, for those of you who don't know, Hispanics and Philanthropy is a nonprofit organization. Um, we are a donors network that works to increase Latino leadership, voice, and equity um, within the philanthropic and social sector. Um, and within our programs, we particularly focus on um, leadership, voice, and equity as pillars of work to be able to uh, directly impact um, and positively influence uh, Latino communities. Um, so this webinar in particular, um, and this report, as I mentioned, is around um, our three-year initiative, HIP to College, um, from 2012 to 2015. Um, the goal of this project was to create strong and sustainable funding and nonprofit networks for Latino student success. So what does that mean? It means that we worked in two different sites, North Carolina and Colorado, um, with communities of funders as well as um, communities of practice um, of nonprofits who really were interested in college access, college retention, and ultimately student success for their own Latino communities. Um, of course, North Carolina and Colorado um, are very different environments with very different policies and, and different kinds of um, situations. Um, socially and politically that allow student, Latino students to thrive um, and of course both sites um, took different approaches to their work. Um, all of this is really highlighted in the report um, but very briefly um, in North Carolina there was a more comprehensive um, look at college access um, and what students really needed to do, um, Latino students really needed to do to just, you know, be prepared and get in that door. Um, and then once they were in that door, um, what did they need to do to stay there? So a more holistic effort. And in Colorado, the work was really focused around summer melt, which is the phenomenon where Latino, or not just Latino, but um, many college intending students, um, by college intending, you know, they've They've been accepted to college. They've enrolled in community college. They've um, they've received some scholarships potentially. Um, but you know, there's something to indicate that they will be going to college in the fall. And over the summer, they for whatever reason they just don't make it. Um, and so in Colorado, this was really identified um, as a particular leverage point um, that the the group there really wanted to to address and go deeper on. So. Very briefly, um, with our agenda today, we have three wonderful speakers. We have Priscilla Montoya Vitello, um, who is the Education Program Manager um, and also works on evaluation for the Latino Community Foundation of Colorado. Um, we have Pilar Rocha Goldberg, who's the President and CEO of El Centro Hispano in Durham, North Carolina. Um, and we have Sonia Olivari, who's the President and CEO of Girls Inc. of Metro Denver in Denver, Colorado. Um, and they're all going to speak to their organization's partnerships and roles in this work, um, and then we'll open it up to, to Q&A. So um, I am very glad to let Priscilla introduce herself, and we can take it from there. Priscilla, you are unmuted. Hello, um, I'm Priscilla, and I'm with the Latino Community Foundation of Colorado. And I want to just start off by saying thank you to Hispanics and Philanthropy um, for their support of this project. Um, without their support, we would not have been able to do the work that, that we've done over these past couple of years. And um, it's been a pleasure and honor to, to work with our community partners as well. So I will start off um, just giving you a little context of Colorado and um, the need that we saw. So Colorado is the eighth largest, has the eighth largest Latino population, um, where 21% of the state is Latino. Um, as you can see from this slide, uh, the number of Hispanics who actually attain a degree is very low. Um, this attainment gap was brought forth um, to 
to the attention of the state by former Go uh, Lieutenant Governor Joe Garcia um, as the head of the Colorado Department of Higher Education. Um, Colorado residents aged 24 to 64 who have an associate degree or higher um, is 20%. And as you can see, um, that's a very significant difference in compared to the white counterparts. So I really liked this image that um, Lieutenant Governor Joe Garcia would, would share with us as we would talk about this on, on a statewide level. So out of 100 Hispanic ninth grade students, you have 100, 100 ninth graders, only 67 are going to graduate high school. Now out of those 67, 28 will enroll in college. Out of those 28, 20 will return for their second year. And out of those 20, only 10 will graduate in 150% of the time, which is five years. Those statistics are very significant to our community. So as we started to think about this need and we looked at summer melt, um, we referenced um, Harvard's work on the summer melt handbook um, we, and, and, and other resources and realized that, you know, um, that summer support is very necessary. And what, can, what could we do about that? So as a foundation, um, since we do not provide direct services, we started to, to think about how we could strategically impact the summer melt issue. So Anne, if you wouldn't mind advancing the slide. Thanks. So this was our response um, to the need. Um, in, in conjunction with Hispanics and Philanthropy, we explored and vetted organizations and then we selected organizations for, in, for an invitation-only RFP to, to actually apply for funding. Um, in 2014, we awarded planning grants. So they had about, I believe it was about four months to come up with a plan and present it um, to a cohort. So in 2014, um, this was offered to two um, school districts two community-based organizations, and one um, scholarship foundation. And you can see who those partners are um, on, on the top of um, the left-hand side. So it's Mableton School District, Girls Inc. Um, of Metro Denver, Adams 14, the Latin American Education Foundation, Mikasa Resource. Um, so with the strategic um, strategic planning and approach to address, again, you know, the larger need, um, we thought that this would be um, an interesting pilot project so that we could look at the different institutional levels of impact as, it, as um, those cross-sections happen with students. So each organization designed their own programs. So again, you know, because as funders we're not direct service providers, we allowed each organization to look at their own capacity, to look at their resources, to look at their constituent base, and to look at their community, and to design their own program to um, address summer melt. Um, some things that we encouraged to include in their program design was ensuring that their design was culturally relevant. Um, most of these, or, all of these organizations, excuse me, um, serve majority Latino um, constituents, not, not exclusively, but um, significant number of Latino um, constituents served. So cultural relevance was very, very important. And, and this includes um, like understanding cultural norms, understanding that staff and, and people who are involved with the program understand um, language and um, in all of these other factors that are not that were not looked at in the initial summer melt handbook as reasons to why Latinos um, are not a attending college in the fall. Um, the second part was parent engagement. Um, we really encouraged um, that to be incorporated in, in the design. And as we've been able to advance from year one to year two, um, we've definitely learned um, how to make this um, piece stronger. 
Um, the third part was encouragement for relational, relational and celebratory um, aspects of the program. So um, I think Sonia Ulubari, who is a CEO of Girls Inc., will speak a little bit more about a college shower that, that we did last year. Um, but again, it's just something to celebrate, especially first generation um, student achievement and encouragement and build trust and pride, um, not only with the individuals, but also with the familial support. Um, and we, all, we found that um, when students have that sense of pride and that family support, their um, likelihood to, to continue on um, despite challenges was greater. Um, last is um, the shared partnership and learnings. Um, through this cohort, we were able to um, establish lots of areas of, of cross-learning with each other. And as a result, as you can see, the summer melt um, decreased from an average of 54% in the area of catchment to an average of 19% across all programs, um, which is a huge a, a huge success. Um, so 93% of our participants were enrolled in college. And in general, as from a funder's perspective, um, some of the learnings that we learned um, that we took away from this project was that by involving different um, organizations, community-based organizations and school districts and a scholarship foundation, they were able to evaluate different strategies, um, institutional strategies. And also, um, it helps us strengthen our opportunity to request supplemental funding. Um, we were able to secure funding from the state of Colorado through their Colorado Opportunity Scholarship Initiative, which has helped us not only um, supplement the work that we were doing with Hispanics and Philanthropy, but also to extend it out um, to 2016 and hopefully to 2017 as well. Um, opportunities for further assessment, um, basically, um, we have seen that there's definitely a need for some some of these programmings to continue through, um, not just from high school to um, freshman year of college, but also from freshman year to second year, second year to third year, all the way till we can get to to actually a, a degree completion. And um, you know the financial concerns continue throughout advancement, um, but cultural relevance and higher education navigation are very essential to. Um, a student's sense of belonging on their campus. And lastly, um, social justice and equity values um, are evident and weaved into our work as we think about systems and systems change on, on a larger level. Thank you, Priscilla. Um, so just to remind everybody, um, the sort of broader work around hip to college, um, which was really about college, um, college access and college retention, so getting with young Latino um, men and women into college um, and then allowing them to stay there and, and complete um, a post-secondary degree took place in two sites. Priscilla's given um, a really great overview of our partnership in Colorado. Um, and now um, Pilar is going to speak to some of the direct work on the ground um, that we accomplished through this program in North Carolina. Um, so, Pilar, you should be unmuted. Pilar, are you there? Pilar? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, can, yes okay. I can hear you perfectly. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, no, and I have to apologize. We are having some legislatures um, proposals out there, so I'm trying to juggle <laughs> everything today. Um, but thank you for um, inviting us to share our experience uh, with the project uh, with Hispanics in Philanthropy. So, um, so as um, Anne said, I'm Pilar Rocha Colbert, I'm the director of El Centro Hispano, and um, we are a Latino nonprofit organization. Uh, who works that works to strengthen the community, build bridges, and serve as advocate for equity and inclusion for Hispanics Latinos in the Triangle area of North Carolina. Education, economic development, and health and well-being um, are our priority program 
um, areas. We serve around 10,000 Latinos um, throughout the year in our different programs, and we have two offices. So um, in all our programs, um, we try to connect and complement each other. We have direct support services, education, health, and community organizing. Uh, but we connect all of them because we believe really this is the key to help um, all our community members in the different age, uh, stage stages they are right now. So um, in our education program, we try to cover the whole family and have a holistic approach because we know how uh, family support and community support is important really for success, um, in, especially in education. So we work uh, with adults. We have uh, literacy in Spanish, parenting classes, ESL, citizenship, and also Spanish classes um, for community members. And uh, in North Carolina, and especially in our area, uh, Durham and Orange County, we still have community members whose Spanish is their second language already because they speak a dialect from other countries. Um, and also we have a school readiness program to prepare kids for kindergarten, uh, tutoring K through 12, and we have our youth group uh, support group. One of the big, biggest challenges we always have is to respond to the demand for services, not only from the Latino community, but also from the stakeholders and government agencies who want to work with our community. And this is when we found um, really um, success support when we got to this project with uh, Hispanics in Philanthropy and the Adelante Coalition um, through the Triangle Latino Student Success. Um, we were able, so the idea of our project was to have academic institut institutions supporting also the work that we do in nonprofits. So, uh, we work with the student action with farm worker. We, we work with the um, Association of Hispanic Professionals and uh, also with NC State. And what we did, we were um, trying to develop a compre comprehensive curriculum for these youth groups that we had in three different areas, that we had in, in Raleigh, in Durham, and in Johnston County, which is um, a rural area, and how we can really put together this curriculum to support our youth um, to get higher education and then complete either um, the two-year degree or uh, full the full four years of college. Um, so after the project, we developed the curriculum um, that includes five key areas, academics, social justice, job preparation, life skills, and higher education uh, preparation. So um, we got together to work in this curriculum that uh, we still using um, after we finish with the collaboration. Uh, and each site really um, incorporated different activities to be able to go through these five key areas in our curriculum. Um, also with uh, the collaboration, what we got as a nonprofit is um, the collaboration developed a leadership committee that included uh, people from media, stakeholders, academic institutions, government, uh, scholarship, foundations um, to come together to the table and um, look at all of the issues uh, that our Latino youth face through the education pipeline and find ways to improve these systems that really will help long term to support them in moving forward uh, for higher education. So. We really um, were able to get create more awareness about this because um, as we feel as a nonprofit, even though we are fortunate because we are in um, counties that where the government and the stakeholders really acknowledge the presence of Latinos and want to work and include Latinos in their projects, they don't know how to work with them. So it's when we come to really um, play a role as organizations to help them understand and work with our community. So through this leadership um, uh, council that they create, that we created with the program, 
we we've been really able to move forward um, some of the um, barriers that we had with our Latino youth. So I can see it even in our public school system. Now they are trying to really work in this pipeline how to help more um, the ESL students to graduate, but also how to help them to apply for college and then try to help them to do follow-up so they can stay in college. So I see um, as you know, after we finish our project, we continue working on this. So it's just really a good base um, for us and for our community to continue higher education. Thank you, Pilar. I think that that is a great overview of the work that um, everybody in the Triangle region was able to do together um, through HIPTA College and through um, our funding networks um, of, of national funders, um, the Lumina Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, and local funders. So in North Carolina, um, our local funders were the Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation um, and the Triangle Community Foundation, as well as individual donors. So um, Pilar really spoke to the collaborative work among the nonprofits, um, the education sector, and the community. Um, and we all know that it, it would not be possible also without the generous support of a variety of donors. Um, so thank you, Pilar. And um, next we have Sonia Ulivari, um, who will be speaking um, to the work on the ground um, and the shape that it took in Colorado, um, which Priscilla has already given some great background on. Uh, Sonia, are you there? I'm here. Thank great. you so much for having me. So hello everyone. Um, like Anne said, I'm Sonia Uluwari from Girls Inc. of Metro Denver. Um, so I'm excited to join you today and talk a little bit about the work that's taken place um, locally for our organization. Um, also too, we'd just like to thank Hispanics in Philanthropy and of course the Latino Community Foundation for making this all possible. So Girls Inc., uh, just to give you some quick background, we are part of a national organization. There's Girls Inc. affiliates across the country, about 90 of them total. We're the only affiliate in Colorado. At our affiliate, which is located in central Denver, we serve about 2,200 girls a year. Those girls are uh, a range in age from, or for range in grade level from first grade to 12th grade, or about six years old to 18 years old. We say 18 plus now. In fact, we have um, uh, internally raised that to about 21 is what we're looking at because of the work specifically through the college transition program. And we have seen a huge shift in even just kind of the numbers of girls that we're seeing in the high school and college program. So um, how I'd like to talk about it first is just kind of what we have seen change in our organization and how we've invested in that um, through the help of the HIP to College program and specifically how some of that work has taken place in this summer and the Summer Melt issue. So um, at Girls Inc., we um, for a long time struggled with our high school program. Because we had served girls at such a young age, what we saw locally is that many of our girls and families would come to Girls Inc. in elementary school and then they would stay for a number of years. So we had really strong retention of girls through elementary and middle school and then we saw a pretty significant drop out, drop off once girls um, got through middle school and got to high school. And for us that was a challenge because one of the resources that we're able to offer locally is a scholarship program. So this year we awarded 65,000 in college scholarships. That's about the amount that we award each year. And we really wanted girl to, girls to take advantage of that scholarship money and then the high school programs that we offered. But we struggled with recruitment and retention of high school girls. Also too, I think it's worth noting too, about 85% of the girls we serve in Denver identify as Latina. So it's a very um, strong component of our program and um, you know, and, and we're very closely tied to other uh, Latino serving organizations locally as well. So when we took a look at our high school program and, you know, the need again to connect girls to that scholarship, 
um, we started to think about what we were offering and where the gaps were. Um, so we have workshops that we do um, that are delivered year-round, um, college prep workshops and also health and sexuality workshops. We really emphasize at our affiliate because we are a girl serving organization and we know that teen pregnancy is a major, major issue for girls in reaching their academic and career goals that we had to incorporate that component to our college prep piece. So in addition to doing kind of the traditional college prep program, programming, we also included the pregnancy prevention and comprehensive sex education as part of that programming that we really, again, looked at as part of long-term economic success for girls. So uh, offered workshops in the college prep traditional space around financial aid, around college applications, around letters of recommendation, around college tours, um, added in that health and sexuality piece to really complement it. And then also um, did more programming around intentional parent engagement. So that was a piece that we, um, previous to this work, did not incorporate, I think, as effectively as we have post-participation in the summer, summer Melt programming. And where that's come into play is not just in the workshop setting, but is in building a more comprehensive case management system. So instead of having girls just come through these workshops, whether they were delivered in school through partnerships, we have about 20 school partnerships a year, um, or in evening workshops or in weekend workshops, we also started to build, again, the case management support. And case management, not from the perspective of um, kind of a more punitive approach to, approach to case management, it was really looking at case management as a way to tie in the relationship building piece, the mentorship based piece, the parent engagement piece, and be able to work one on one with girls and families to look at their specific challenges, fears, um, assets, and, and how those can contribute to um, you know, a smooth college transition and then um, you know, college um, uh, you know, continuation towards graduation. So pulling in that piece was really important to us. We were able to hire a full-time college educator to help with that. And then we built programming around that. So we continued our scholarship program, our scholarship applications in one year. Um, previous to participation in this program, we got about 15 to 18 applications. Um, this last year, which is two years in, we got 47 applications to that scholarship program. So the need you know, continues to build, and we also are talking about now, you know, the conversation has shifted from not having enough applicants for the scholarship to how we grow it to fill this growing need that has presented itself, how we challenge ourselves to then fill that on the back end with um, being able to build that scholarship fund and get out more of those scholarships. We also, um, so we saw an increase in that scholarship program. We also built in more comprehensive college tours. And we did that in two ways. One is we had been doing college tours previously that were like one day college tours just for girls. And what we realized was the parent piece was really missing from those. So a girl would go home excited about a college she had seen, but the parent was disconnected to that. And so we're doing parent um, and girl college tours this spring, which were, um, you know, trying to close that gap and trying to also get the parent connected and excited to those campuses. And then we've done for the last two years a college tour of the state of Colorado. So over spring break week, where girls have a more extended time off period, we show them between eight and ten colleges um, during that week. And so they're actually staying overnight on campus. They're going essentially on a road trip across, across Colorado to see those different schools. Because what we were worried about was girls seeing one school and then saying, you know, that's it, I'll go there. And they have not looked at other options. You know, it's the one that they've had some exposure to. And we really want them to weigh out what is the best environment for me? Where, what kind of community do I want to live in? What are the resources that are offered? And have the ability to weigh those options and then make a good decision based on having the choice um, to do that and the exposure to multiple, multiple campuses. And then we also 
um, built in the college shower piece. And this was really interesting. So the college shower idea, you know, it's a very kind of, um, you know, it's, it's, I would say it's kind of gender-centric to our work at Girls, Inc. It builds off the idea of celebrating life's transitions with showers, whether it's a baby shower, a wedding shower. And so we had said we want to put together a college shower that really celebrates and sends girls off with the things that they need um, for school, whether that's dorm room, whether it's bus passes, whether it's a computer. And so the idea of just really showering and celebrate them, celebrating them as they make that transition to college. And so the Latino Community Foundation and HIP were really excited about this idea. And it grew from just doing it at Girls Inc. to doing it with all of the partners in the Summer Melt um, grantee pool to doing it even with outside organizations. So we were able to do a shower last year um, and that actually um, included um, folks from a leadership program that I was in through our Metro Chamber of Commerce. Um, and they kind of took it on as a class project and they, what ended up um, happening is it turned into a college shower called Ready, Set, College. It happened in early August on a Saturday. There was about a half day of programming that was put together, including keynote speakers, workshops. And then at the end of that half day of programming, a big giveaway where we gave away 20 laptop computers. And then we also gave away a bag of gift cards of about $500 worth of gift cards and other swag um, to each student who attended. There was about 80 students who attended. And so that was just a great kind of send off um, and way to celebrate um, you know, that transition, um, knowing that many of the students, first generation college students, it would be the first, first time that they would be leaving home, it would be the first time that they would be um, you know, setting foot in a space that, that wasn't as familiar to them. And although the gift cards and all of that swag were great giveaways, um, I think just knowing that people were cheering for them, were behind them, were rooting for them, um, that that also too I think goes a long way. And so that was some of the celebratory piece that we built in. We also just got through the first um, school year of girls who we had seen through that transition process to college. And so we also stayed in touch with them during breaks when they were home. So we had face-to-face -face visits with them during like the winter break while they were here. And then during um, and leading up to finals week this spring, we sent all of them care packages to let them know we're thinking about them, they can do this. You know, again, sort of this idea of folks rooting for you. And so we did that as they were heading into their spring finals as well. So those are a few of the things that we've been able to build in um, in Denver that, you know, for us, again, aligned with the idea that, um, you know, we serve a girl population, that um, we really see, we don't refer to girls that are affiliate as at risk. We refer to them as at promise that we want them to, to fulfill this promise and how we can support them in doing that. And that is a pro-girl celebratory environment. So, um, so it's a little bit about what's happened in Denver. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Sonia. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Um, um. There we go. So now I'm not echoing there. Um, again, thank you, Sonia. Um, and now really, um, the the panel is excited and open to questions um, from everybody here um, in the audience, and um, you know, really, um, I, I hope some of you have been thinking about questions. Again, please feel free to to type them into the chat box, um, and I can read them out loud. Um, or if you're able to um, raise your hand, and we can unmute you. Um, that is also an option um, to ask your question. So, um, you know, I think that really, oh, here we go. So Frank Secha has his hand raised. Hi, yes, I do. Uh, can you hear me just fine? Absolutely, yeah. Thanks, Excellent. Uh, I just want to, I had a question for Pilar, if, if possible, if you're still there, Pilar. I, I just wanted to get a feeling for what your uh, uh, please forgive my uh, the the 
naivety of the question. I'm from California, and I was wondering what kind of response uh, are you receiving in North Carolina for what you are doing? Um, thank you for the question. How are you? I'm so, fine. <laughs> so you're referring, so what we are doing uh, with the program with the youth about uh, all the education and how uh, the government, the stakeholders are receiving this response? So, yes. Okay. Yeah, so, um, you know, in our state we are having some uh, mixed feelings about what the support we are getting from uh, the government mainly, but at least from our um, our um, government in the cities and in the counties, we are receiving a really great response of what we've been doing. And even in um, two of the school, three of the schools uh, that um, have more Latinos, they open the doors for us to go and come and work with the youth there. Uh, and they see really what we are doing, the work we are doing as an asset for them, and really helping them um, to get these kids to the level they need to be. Um, and as I said, it's not only for college, but we are seeing, uh, you know, our second generation mainly, they are in elementary school, around 25%, uh, at least in Durham County uh, schools are Latinos, and they are getting to the school since kindergarten not well prepared. So we are seeing kids in fourth grade who read as a first uh, level grader. Um, and then we are seeing these kids getting behind. In the other hand, we have also um, our youth that uh, they came, you know, first generation, as you probably saw it before uh, in California, who are better prepared, they are good students, but then they get to middle or um, middle school or higher school um, and not, not seeing a path for uh, graduation and, and even for higher education. So um, right now in the Durham Public Schools they have um, a project now how to really help uh, these kids, the ESL and refugees, and the majority of the refugees we have here in Durham are from Central America and how to help them really improve since, you know, K through 12 and even we are talking now about pre-K how to help them uh, and then really connecting them and for higher education. So the response we are having from the local government and stakeholders has been great. That is, that is outstanding to hear. Uh, if, if I may, I have just one last question maybe for Sonia, if you're still on. Um, do you, is there a Girls Inc. chapter in California? Yes, I'm still here, and there are a number of Girls Inc. affiliates in California. Yes. Excellent. So, what part Thank of California? Ladies. What part of California are you in? Uh, Southern California. Yes, there is a, a large Orange County affiliate. There's an affiliate in Los Angeles. Um, there's an affiliate in Carpentaria, Santa Barbara, and San Diego. Would you happen to have one in Kern County by chance? That I'm not sure of, but um, if you want to connect offline and send me an email, I can send you a list of all the affiliates. Excellent. I really appreciate uh, your, your presentation today, ladies. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Thanks for those questions. Um, so looking for to see if there are any other hands um, raised or any questions in the in the text box. Um, so I have a, a question. Um, okay, so thanks, Rosa. Um, so Rosa would also like to get a list. So after the, the webinar, um, we'll be sending out the slide deck and contact information for all the panelists um, to, to follow up as well. So, so at HIP, we're happy to do that. Um, I have a question that um, is for all the panelists. Um, when you're thinking about, and you know, for everybody who, who works in the education space, this is always a big question. Um, 
when you're thinking about the the pipeline to college, so you know, and Pilar really alluded to this, whether it's pre-K or or K-12 or that you know period in between um, high school and college, um, you know, and, and each part of the pipeline has you know has its own challenge to make sure that kids are are where they need to be academically, and then um, you know also able to get through to to a post-secondary. Um, program, whether it's an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree or or whatever ha whatever comes next, um, you know, each piece is is its own kind of part of, of the puzzle. So within this kind of high school to college um, section that, that we all worked on together, um, what do each of you think um, was your your biggest surprise? Um, kind of working on this this piece of the puzzle. So, um, Priscilla, um, you can go first. Um, hi. So, um, I would say that I think the biggest surprise was how willing um, universities were um, are um, to partner with community organizations. Um, it's not just high schools. Um, I think that that you're right, that there are so many pieces to the pipeline that um, that are important and, and that need focusing, you know, you need to focus on, but um, that specifically that high school to, to post-secondary education um, piece is a very difficult one to bridge. And I think part of that is, um, especially when dealing with public, public institutions, um, public schools, um, you know, they're, they're they're done as soon as a, a student is is graduated, and um, there's a lot of creativity happening um, in the state of Colorado as to how to address this in, in a larger scale. Um, so there are um, various collaborations happening across the state, specifically in Denver through the, um, the um, Denver College Attainment Network. Um, they created a Summer Bridge Action Team to look at community organizations and higher ed institutions um, and to see how they could partner um, together to make that transition smoother. Um, so that was really surprising, um, pleasantly surprising for me to see that um, there are a lot of people willing to work together. Thanks, Priscilla. Um, Pilar, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, so one of the of the things um, that surprised me was um, really that we have some resources in some of the colleges because what we what we are seeing is we are getting really good at getting the Latino youth into college, but then the retention they are dropping off after the first year. And what we found was. Uh, they didn't feel comfortable, some of them. Some of them needed to go back to work to support their families. Um, but also they didn't feel welcome or they couldn't connect or couldn't understand very well the system. But then um, we also found that in some of the institutions close by to our areas where they were going, they, there were some um, Latino support groups, but how they couldn't really reach out to these new new students or vice versa, so they weren't really getting this support. So we were, um, I think that was a surprise even for us as an organization that we've, we've never connected with these institutions or the, these groups in these institutions. So I think we learned that too, um, how to really start connecting more with those groups to really give the support um, to the students. Thank you. And Sonia? What, what are your thoughts? Um, I, I would agree um, about partnerships um, and leveraging resources from co the colleges and universities. We've had a lot of, um, we've had a lot of great response from those partners. I think the other piece too is how really committed families are to this process. Um, we have seen parents and families step up in ways that um, you know, have even surprised us. For example, um, going back even to some of the initial co initial comments that you had in around pipeline work, um, we just started a new college prep program this summer that is more based in STEM. That is almost all 
Latina and first generation students, college potentially first generation college students. And um, it's a program that is a college prep program that starts the summer after seventh grade. And it is a five year program. And so that is a long term commitment for a lot of the families involved, for all of the families involved. And it's interesting, um, you know, we thought the families would really that they would really question that long of a commitment, that they would push back on that, um, but um, they didn't at all. In fact, they were really excited about the opportunity to start that young and that early. Um, and then that program also, too, is at a college campus, so it exposes girls to college um, after that seventh grade year and gets them comfortable on those campuses. And the partnership that we've had from the college specifically this year, it's uh, Metropolitan State University of Denver, uh, to provide that resource and to invest in girls that were that young, looking at the long-term potential outcome of that program, um, has been really, really great as well. So I think one, families step up into that space, they see the opportunity and they want to be able to support it and be helpful and be part of the process and that we can leverage resources from the colleges and universities, I think, even earlier than we, um, than we know. Thanks. So we have um, a two-part question from Genevieve Amador. Um, so I think this is for both Pilar and Sonia, so I'm just going to unmute both of you. Um, so Genevieve's two questions are, um, Going back, Sonia, to your what you just mentioned about parental involvement, really, how did how did you um, get parents to be more involved um, in the programs? And then, as a sort of follow up question, is who would we start with um, if we want to start a pipeline um, to college um, in our own communities? And especially, I think in both cases, especially if the parents are undocumented. Okay, this is Pilar. Um, in all of our programs, we try um, to involve parents, uh, not only to come and support the, the youth or the kids in their own program, but we have some programming for them so they can really support uh, their, their kids uh, through this education pipeline. And specifically for youth, if they want to be part of our youth program, uh, parents need to come and they sign up um, an agreement with us and they have to come to certain meetings uh, so we can really communicate with them about what is going on uh, with their kids and also to get some permission for some of the activities we are doing and even they come with us to some of the activities we do. So it's the way we um, involve uh, parents in these activities. Um, and can you repeat the second question? Oh, how we can support uh, for higher education and documented kids? Um, I that think it's it, how do you how do you engage the parents um, when the parents are undocumented? And then the other question is who do you recommend um, starting with um, if somebody's thinking about this kind of education work in their own communities? Okay, um, and about you know, we engage all the parents, and I could say probably majority of our parents are undocumented, so that's really not, we never ask, but that's not really uh, something that um, prevents them to participate and be active um, in our programs or with the kids. Um, and then um, I would say we start with the, with the, in the education pipeline, we try to work with the whole community, but I think it depends um, of your community. How is your community? Because as we see it here in our area, we still see newcomers. So first generation, majority from Mexico who come, or Central America who come to work in the landfill or construction, education level around third grade. So we try to um, engage the whole family in, in the education program with the different programs depending the needs uh, that they have. So we, uh, how we um, approach the kids. So we go to different uh, schools where we know more Latinos are for the youth program uh, and if we can get into their Latino groups that they have already formed. 
uh, but also um, because we have a direct support services where it's a walking office, people come for services, you know, Monday through Thursday, 9 to 5 with no appointment. When they come for whatever reason they come to us, we talk to them and um, see what, you know, where can we refer them to our own programs to really support for the reason they came in through the door. Thanks, Pilar. Um, Sonia, what are your thoughts? Um, very similar to we do kind of regular parent engagement work. It starts when, you know, girls first become involved with Girls Inc. We require parents to attend orientation, to, um, you know, get involved in a certain number of events each year. We have year-round family events, so we do things around, um, we do things around holidays, we do work and weekend things as well, so family dinner nights that we host at the center, um, weekend family events that we host at our center. Um, so it's, I think, an ongoing culture of parent engagement and then also allowing parents to give feedback and then taking that feedback really seriously um, so that parents feel like they have a voice in the work and that there's a partnership that exists. So I think having, um, you know, having a vehicle to collect that feedback from parents and then to use that um, to continue to develop and improve programming is really important. Um, also, too, I think, um, you know, on the piece around where to start with partnerships with colleges and universities, we started, when we started looking at more comprehensive partnerships, um, you know, multi-year partnerships, with where um, schools were that were already strong pip pipelines for our girls, um, which schools had strong numbers of, um, you know, uh, people of color, student bodies. Um, the partnership that we have with MSU Denver, MSU Denver provides um, in-state tuition to undocumented students, um, and they also are working to become an, a Hispanic serving institute and recognized as one. So those things all led us to understand the alignment that exists and start there first. Um, we also, too, for like the college tour that we do of the state, um, we work with um, offices in those colleges and universities um, that serve first-generation college students, that serve students of color or non-traditional students, um, and then also, too, are connected to girls that are alumni of Girls, Inc. So the other thing that's been successful with that statewide college tour is that we have some Girls, Inc. alumni at many of those sites who help to host and create that bridge when we come to visit. So there's a familiarity with somebody who's on campus. There's, you know, an alumni who can say, I was you, and here's what I thought about. Here's, you know, what I found when I came to college. Here's what was a surprise to me or, you know, was difficult for me. And so I think creating that bridge um, through alumni engagement is also a really effective way of starting to build those relationships, you know, with not just the, um, you know, the campus offices, but also to, you know, this, the students that, the, that, this, that um, you know, you know, will be their friends and peers and colleagues. And for us, that biggest bridge was our alumni. So I think that's been a successful place to, to build that connection because girls can go in feeling like, hey, I know someone or I know a couple girls or there's some girls and girls who were there, you know, who will help me and there's that level of commitment to each other. So I think as much as we can sort of build that sense of community and have those actual real FaceTime connections, the, um, the more effective it is. Thank you. Um, so, Cecilia, um, I'm going to unmute you now so you can you can comment on your your niece's story. Um, Cecilia, are you there? You should be. You're unmuted, Cecilia. If you can speak. Cecilia. Okay. Um, well, if if that's not working, then um, basically Cecilia's. Okay. So Cecilia can't unmute. Um, Cecilia, um, 
wrote a comment, my Latina niece grew up in Grand Junction and just graduated from CSU with a mechanical engineering degree. She was greatly impacted by the local chapter of the Society of Hispanic Engineers. I think this is another strategy working with Hispanic professional organizations and chambers. And how can we connect those successful 10 Latino grads um, with high schoolers? Um, so I think, Sonia, you, you addressed some of this in your last comment, but um, do you, ha do you or, or Pilar um, have any other thoughts um, around how to, how to connect um, successful Latino youth back with the, you know, the kids who are you know, three or four or five years younger than them? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a great idea. It's similar to, you know, the alumni piece for us. Um, and I do think it's having, you know, it's being intentional about finding finding out where those um, potential mentors are to building in some type of structure or connection mechanism um, to students. Um, but, I mean, we definitely use professionals. Um, to create those mentor-based relationships, even if it's, you know, a, done in a group setting, which is what we use more than one-on-one -on -one mentorship, is doing group mentorship. And so I think any of those types of, you know, professional societies, you know, specifically for, um, you know, for students, um, for Latino students and other students of color is really, really important because students have to be able to see themselves in that success. And I think that that's, you know, one of the ways to leverage that. So I think the first step is identifying it, and the second step is knowing what the vehicle is to connect. Thanks, Sonia. Um, Pilar, is there anything that you would add? Um, yes, I totally agree. We, we do that. Um, we connect them. Or even we try to connect them with um, youth that has been in our groups before, so they can be a role model or mentoring, but more in a group setting as um, individually. Um, <clears throat> and right now we are also um, participating in other initiatives in in uh, our cities about trying to get also internships for these um, kids in some uh, companies that have Latino um, employees or something, so they can see themselves um, in those areas. Um, and also mm, with our DACA youth, um, we've been trying lately when we have some openings at the, at the organization to bring them on board uh, for some of the work we can offer, so then they can be also, um, we bring them to our youth group to talk to the group and, and encourage them to continue for other education, higher education. Thank you. Um, so I know we're over time, and, and thanks to everybody for your patience um, And as we're going over. And, and, and you know, I really thank you um, to everybody for your, your thoughtful questions, your thoughtful comments. Um, and then we, we did have another question. Um, earlier um, from Nancy Hernandez. Um, can HIP share info about expanded opportunities for these kinds of programs in other areas and what the requirements would be? Um, Nancy, that's something that, that we're definitely working on, um, but we're very hopeful that, um, that we'll be able to share positive news um, more broadly moving forward. Um, I think that it's very clear that all of this work is very needed and extremely powerful. Um, you know, as even just as we we tell these stories, um, but also um, when youth are able to um, speak for themselves and speak to their experiences, um, you know, through these programs. Um, for example, we brought a delegation um, of the, the youth who participated from North Carolina um, to um, a, a National Latino Student Success Meeting um, in D.C. last fall, and it was one of those experiences that, um, you know, really spoke to 
the decision makers in the room and and also um, I think for many of the youth it was it was their first time to DC it was their first time um, staying in in a hotel like the hotel we stayed in um, and to just see that their their voices are important and and that they're welcomed and that they're needed um, is something that you know we weren't able to address in the the short time we've had here together but but it's also very important to consider um, so um, I would just like to you know for Priscilla um, Pilar and Sonia um, if if you each have a, a final closing comment, um, we'll be following up uh, early next week with the webinar recording, um, the slides, contact information, um, and a link to the, the report itself, the evaluation report, so everybody can take the time um, to read through that. Um, so Priscilla, any final thoughts? Uh, yes, I just want to again say thank you to Hispanics and Philanthropy for your support of this project. And um, something that we look forward to is um, continued uh, evaluation, continued collabor collaborations, um, you know, looking at the longer term effects and um, also hopefully creating strategies for policy change. Thanks, Priscilla. Um, Pilar, final thoughts? Um, yeah, thank you, and uh, really, uh, I would like to thank all the partners and collaborators, and especially HIP, who brought us together. Um, and I think this really opened to us a lot of collaborations. Um, and we all know, um, for nonprofits lately, uh, getting funding for so, so for the programs or the activities we do. Uh, it's more uh, appealing when we do it in a collaboration than uh, an only organization. So I think we learned a lot from this collaboration to really um, work on this and, and see how we can be more efficient with the funds we can get. So, um, and as I said before, we opened a lot of doors uh, for our youth, Latino youth, um, to continue uh, improving their education. So thank you. Thank you, Pilar. Um, and Sonia, the last word. Um, yeah, I mean, I just really echo what everyone has said on the panel. Um, you know, we as a single organization could not have the impact that we have without utilizing our community partnerships um, to deliver services and to leverage more resources uh, to then get down to communities. And so. Um, I would say know what your assets are, know what your strengths are as an organization, and build partnerships that complement those. Um, don't feel competitive when our students access services from other organizations. They need all the support that they can get to be successful, and we have to be able to understand, again, what we do well and where the gaps are and how to fill those in with, other, with others doing this work in the community. Thank you. Um, thanks once again. Just really thanks to everybody um, for being here on the line today. Um, I hope everybody has a great weekend, um, and we all look forward to to continuing the work and the collaborations. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>